Hello, I'm Mark Norman, folklore researcher and author. Welcome to the Folklore Podcast and part two of our look into the folklore of the vampire. Before we begin, there are two very important points that I would like to address on this subject. Firstly, I wanted to address one point from part one of this investigation. After that episode was released, I was contacted by a listener who questioned my choice of using the word gypsy and suggested that it might be construed as offensive. I sincerely hope that it was not taken that way, and this was not highlighted by anybody else, but I would like to clarify. This podcast is a celebration and examination of the beliefs and traditions of the many and diverse peoples with whom we share this planet. It is fully accepting and inclusive of all races, religions, ethnic groups and world views, and seeks to represent them fairly. However, the nature of the subject means that many of the sources dealt with are old. Meaning changes over time, and this applies as much to linguistics as it does to symbolism. No offence should be taken or assumed from anything presented on this podcast, and if any is inadvertently presented, then my apologies are unreservedly offered. Secondly, as these episodes were being prepared, News began to break about an outbreak of mob violence in townships around Malawi and the surrounding areas of Africa. This news pertained to modern-day hunts for and killing of people who were said to be vampires. It is a similar situation to that seen in Papua New Guinea and other areas surrounding modern-day witch hunts. In the Western world, we can be very quick to pour scorn on these communities describing them as uneducated or backward. I do not believe that we have a right to tar other communities with these descriptions, and stated this position publicly, to which I found agreement from people on the ground in that country. Originally this was an important point that I was intending to make in this introduction, but instead I reached out to someone who would be able to make the point far more eloquently and with a more informed position than I ever could. Garrett Erickson is a historian living in Western Cape. He is the owner of thisishistory.org website and is an expert on the political history of Southern Africa. He also has connections with a number of scholars who work in the affected areas. Garrett very kindly prepared this statement, which I think deserves to be presented in full. The views and observations presented in this statement, it should be stressed, are those of Garrett himself and not necessarily the folklore podcast. He says, Africa is vast. So vast it can encompass the entire United States, China and many other countries easily within its borders. There are easily thousands of cultural groupings, languages and mythos cited throughout the continent. In modern times, many of these groupings have melded and mixed with each other and with outside influences mostly thanks to colonialism and the legacy thereof. Influences such as the Christian and Islamic religions which, along with their teachings and prejudices, have also brought their demons and boogeymen. Now it should be noted that of course Africa has its fair share of monsters and legends which were around long before any cultural incursions or melding. But where Africa is unique is the sheer scale of the mixing that has occurred with the local and foreign mythos and beliefs forming a modern Africa, which finds itself torn between traditional and foreign beliefs and the modern, secular world. Many countries in Africa find themselves on the receiving end of foreign aid relief. In many cases, this relief is not seen as a boon at all, but rather a repeat of the colonial legacy which ravaged the continent less than 100 years ago. As such, many locals view modern medical applications by aid workers especially those of the UN, as intruders at best, and at worst as active participants in harming their physical and spiritual health. Traditional medicine and beliefs are still strong in many parts of the continent, in part due to a lack of education and access to modern conveniences, and due to continued corruption and greed, which often leaves the country sucked dry of resources by foreign powers via the presidential and corporate gatekeepers. As was the case barely 200 years ago in Europe and the early US, witch hunts are a fairly common occurrence, 
as the population seek to remedy their powerlessness and poverty in any way they can. This is often in the form of violent outbursts aimed at destroying what they believe to be harming them, which more often than not devolves into monsters, in the form of either weak or suspicious members of a town or village, or, as has just happened in Malawi, the hunting of so-called vampires. The distrust of UN personnel, and especially medical personnel, and the belief in witchcraft is so strong that simple rumours can often spark massive violent surges of roaming vigilantes. It is difficult to say exactly what sparked it this time, but it seems that the rumour of bloodsuckers may have been triggered by UN or World Health Organisation doctors taking blood for tests from local residents. This eventually grew into a full-fledged panic, and the violence was a natural extension of that. It is very easy to scoff at these occurrences or to label this as savage Africa, but let's not forget that many well-educated people in so-called civilised societies often believe that things like music or movies can physically or spiritually harm a person and may even contain demons. All of us are not so removed from such behaviours as mob killings of supposed monsters as we might think. It is important to understand the context behind these events, so as to not only understand why they are happening in a modern Africa, but why they happen at all, globally speaking. Witches, vampires and monsters are all lurking in our imaginations, and it only takes the flick of a light switch to bring them to the fore for many people. Add to that a lack of resources, a legacy of oppression, religious fervour and a general sense of powerlessness, and you have a recipe for instant chaos. I'm extremely grateful to Garrett for taking the time to prepare this statement. The themes are culturally extremely important, and in a future episode of the podcast we will plan to return and examine the modern beliefs in this area in more detail. Now, let's continue with this episode. Folklore. The beliefs, traditions and culture of the people. Passed on in the most part through the spoken word, folklore expresses our values, our shared ideas with others. It is both how we were and how we are. Without a record, our customs and traditions may become lost to us in the present. But under the surface, we still draw on them. We still know. It's time to recall our forgotten history and to record the new. This is the Folklore Podcast. In the first part of this examination, we looked at the various types of vampire and vampiric belief throughout the world. Now that we are familiar with these, we move on to examine the ways in which people protected themselves against vampires and how, if the dead did manage to rise as vampires, they could be destroyed. As with other types of supernatural threat, and we saw this in our episode looking at concealed objects, Protection was often sought through the use of apotropaic magic. This term derives from the Greek word apotropain, apo meaning away, and tropain to turn. This would in many cases take the form of burial with certain grave goods. Objects would often be placed in the mouth of a corpse. The reason for doing this was twofold. It would either have been to stop the spirit from returning to the earthly body in the first place, or alternatively, to prevent it from leaving the body if it already resided there. Sometimes a bulb of garlic might be placed in the mouth. Garlic is now, of course, a common stereotype for dispelling vampires. Often a coin would be used. This seems to resemble the ancient Greek idea of placing a coin in order to pay the toll to cross the river Styx in the journey through the underworld. 
In this case, though, only the actual object seems to have carried forward with its use having changed. The tradition has, in fact, continued into more recent folklore in Greece, surrounding the Vrikolokas. With this type of vampire, a wax cross and piece of pottery are placed on the body to stop it being turned into a vampire. The pottery is to be inscribed with the phrase, Jesus Christ conquers. Interestingly, it is also from the Greek records that we may draw an odd connection between vampires and butterflies. The spirit of a vampire is sometimes thought to take the form of this animal, and we find the Greek word psyche has dual meanings of both soul and butterfly. There are other fascinating dual linguistic meanings in Serbian law also. This is one of the countries where the vampire is said to take the form of a butterfly, and, in the Serbian language, the word glogrvac means both butterfly and hawthorn stake. The symbol of the stake is well known, and we will return to this later. If we want to find the origin of the idea that vampires may take the form of butterflies, we probably need to turn to Malaysia and stories about a species of moth that sucked blood. There are many other burial rites and rituals which pertain to protection against a corpse rising or returning as a vampire. Inverted burial was well known as a form of protection. In Europe, it was also common to sever the tendons of the legs at the knee. In a similar way, the corpse may be bound instead. Tying the arms and legs was said to prevent a body from becoming a revenant and walking abroad. Exactly how the tying took place would vary depending on the customs of the area. In some places, the mouth would also be tied shut to prevent the body from chewing the other ropes. Binding a corpse was restricted to pre-burial only, as the ropes would impede passage through the next world. The ropes would therefore be cut before internment. In Romania, the ropes were buried close to the grave. It is through these ropes being subsequently dug up and used in black magic rites that the strigoi were created. From Romania, we move to Bulgaria to examine interesting links into the present. Here, the undead creature is known as the Ubauer, recognisable by having only one nostril and a barb on the end of the tongue. To protect against the Ubauer, one could fence in the grave where the body is buried, burn candles and place a sunflower at the threshold of your property. But to destroy the Ubauer, it was generally the case that you would call upon the services of the vampire killer, or vampir dija. This sorcerer would fill a hole in the tombstone with dirt and poisonous herbs and pierce the corpse to vent its gases. A more severe and dangerous form of destroying the Ubau was by bottling. We may think of witch bottles here, but the difference is that the witch bottle protects against witches at a property, whereas with the Ubau, the actual spirit is being contained in the bottle. We may find many parallels, in fact, with the laying of ghosts in Western folklore. The sorcerer would lie in wait for the vampire before giving chase, driving the creature away from all forms of shelter. Once this is done, the sorcerer would use a religious icon of some kind, a picture or relic, to force the vampire into the neck of the bottle. An additional lure for the Ubauer may be to place manure in the bottle, this being its main source of food, only taking human blood if manure is scarce. Once inside, the bottle would be sealed and thrown into a fire destroying the Ubau. In modern times, archaeologists working in Bulgaria in 2012 unearthed a number of graves which exhibited many signs of vampire burial techniques dating from the medieval period. It was common in many parts of Europe to scatter poppy seeds, millet or even sand at a grave thought to contain a vampire. The belief was that vampires would have an unavoidable compulsion to count the grains which lay on the ground. Listeners of a certain age may recall a similar compulsion exhibited by the Count on Sesame Street, a character which plays both on the name and the compulsion to act in this way. Folklore tropes really do show up in the most unlikely of places, you see. We find a similar theme exhibited in vampire lore across Asia and the subcontinent also. Chinese stories make reference of the same counting compulsion pertaining to sacks of rice, for example. The idea may be traced right back into myths from India and from South America, 
where it relates not only to vampires, but also to other evil supernatural threats, such as witches. I would like to return now to this idea of piercing the body of a vampire. It is important to draw the distinction between piercing and staking a vampire, the latter of course being one of the most well-known of the ways of destroying a vampire. Piercing a corpse is different in that it is a form of protection to prevent a body from rising as a vampire rather than destroying one which already exists. Corpse piercing was common in many areas, particularly northern parts of Europe, Greece and the Balkans. Nails may have been hammered into the heads of corpses or into the legs and feet. In some areas, such as Poland, a sickle would be buried with its blade over the abdomen or neck of the corpse, so that if the body became too bloated, as the transformation into a vampire could cause, then it would be pierced and prevent the turning from taking place. Evidence of these practices were found in the grave discoveries in Bulgaria which I referred to earlier. To confuse things slightly, wooden stakes were sometimes used in this preventative way as well, by piercing the corpse through the chest and into the ground. This symbolic pinning of the corpse to the ground was believed to make sure that the deceased found eternal rest and did not return. If the stake did not pin the corpse directly, then it might be hammered into the ground itself, so that if the corpse did rise, then it would be impaled as it did so. It is, of course, as a means of destruction for the undead that the stake is most well known. The recommended length for a wooden stake to be used for killing a vampire is between two and two and a half feet. One end should be flattened, and the other sharpened to a very fine point. A number of woods may be considered when creating a stake, in some cases these are traditional to the geographic area which we are examining. In Russia and areas of the Balkans, the wood of choice was ash. Pliny the Elder suggested in his work Natural History that all evil things feared the wood of the ash. This was the wood which made up Yggdrasil, the tree which Norse myth told was that upon which the world was founded. The name probably derived from the word Asher, meaning man in the Norse. In Serbia, as we've already seen, hawthorn was used. This is cited as the best possible choice. Hawthorn is known as the symbol of good hope. This is connected to the turning of the seasons and the end of winter bringing in the springtime. The Roman people considered the hawthorn to be a charm against witchcraft, and we've already seen various parallels between vampire lore and that connected to witches so this should not be too surprising. Athenian women would wear hawthorn at weddings in a symbolic manner. In England, it is considered unlucky to bring hawthorn into the house, particularly if it's in flower, and if this does inadvertently happen, then it should be thrown back out of the front. We may also find hawthorn in use for both protection and prevention, areas which we have already explored. In Bosnia, people leaving a wake would drop twigs of hawthorn that they had concealed upon their person into the street. The reasoning for this is that the deceased, if they returned as a vampire, would be compelled to pick them up, and would then be too distracted to follow anyone home. This is similar to the rice or seed counting ideas already examined. Also, the thorns of the hawthorn would be used to pierce the corpse, another idea already covered, by placing them in the shroud at burial. In other areas, we may find oak, juniper, buckthorn or whitethorn. Aspen was considered by some to be powerful because of the belief that the cross upon which Christ was crucified was made from this wood. For the same reason, aspen laid upon a grave may also have acted as a preventative measure to stop a vampire from rising. Blackthorn was seen as potent enough in Romania that people would have it sewn into their clothing. It is most common for a vampire to be staked through the chest, as most films will suggest. However, in Russia and northern parts of Germany, staking through the mouth was favoured, and in some areas of Serbia, the stomach. Wherever on the body the stake was placed, it was important to make sure that the blow was firmly delivered by a hammer of some kind. This is because the staking needed to take place in one movement in order to not anger the vampire or give it time to respond. In some traditions, using more than one blow on the stake will actually revive the vampire. 
This is the case with the Upia of Russian law. As with some of the Polish vampire types, the Upia is abroad during the day rather than the traditional night hours, usually between noon and midnight, so you will at least have the light on your side if you're trying to destroy it. According to Russian and Ukrainian tradition, you should attempt to attach a thread to the button of something that the Upia is wearing, so that you can trace it back to its lair. Before staking, a liberal amount of holy water should be sprinkled around. As well as staking, the Upia may also be destroyed by cremation. Fire is a relatively common means of destruction, and also by decapitation. Removing the head is one of the most effective ways of destroying a vampire. The idea most likely comes from the fact that the vampire cannot exist without its head or its heart, because these cannot be regenerated. A sexton's blade is normally used to remove the head. It is important that the head is kept away from the neck after decapitation to ensure that reattachment does not take place. It is for this reason that grave discoveries where the skull is found between the feet of the corpse, for example, are referred to as potential vampire burials. This is the way that the body would have been interred in Lithuania. In other countries, it may be placed behind the buttocks. The head should be placed away from the arms as well as from the neck, otherwise the vampire may rise, carrying its head, according to some beliefs. The type of vampire known as the Nachzera may be rendered permanently helpless by placing the head away from the body, with a wall of soil separating the two. The Nachzera is found in the Kashubs of northern Europe, as well as some areas of Germany. A particularly nasty creature, it has the ability to kill its relatives from a distance using a sort of sympathetic magic. While it's in its grave, it will first eat its shroud before beginning to consume its own flesh. As it does this, it draws the life from its relatives who will start to waste. Some traditions then hold that it leaves its coffin or tomb and goes to drink the blood of its family. It may also ring the bells in the local church, bringing death to anybody who is unlucky enough to hear them, or it may cause death by allowing its shadow to fall upon the victim. As well as decapitation with an axe, the Nachzera may also be destroyed by putting a coin in its mouth, another tradition which, as we've already seen, is often more of a preventative measure. Another crossover between prevention and destruction is in the use of garlic. We've already noted that this may be used for protection. In China and Malaysia, it would be rubbed on the heads of children to stop them from being attacked. In the Philippines, it was applied to the armpit, with the same result. Slavic people would hang it not only from their windows and doors, but also around the necks of themselves and their children. When destroying a vampire by staking or decapitation, garlic would be poured into the mouth. We may trace back the traditions of garlic being potent in this way to ancient Egypt, where it was thought highly medicinal. There are, of course, less well-known ways of destroying a vampire. Sabbatarians, that is, those born on a Saturday who possess the power to see into the other realm, may be well-placed to hunt down the undead. In Greek areas, they would be used as a weapon against the Vrykolokas. They would also be assisted by a fetch in the form of a dog. We've examined the idea of the fetch before when looking at black dog folklore, where there are a few crossovers with vampire lore, although they are relatively minor. Sabbatarians would also sometimes be able to act as a protective force against vampires. Tradition in some areas states that they would wear their underclothes inside out when doing this. Clothing may also be found as a method of destroying vampires, in particular the use of socks. This is common in areas of Eastern Europe, and it plays on the ideas already discussed of the vampire being obsessed with counting items. The left sock would be stolen from the grave of the vampire. This was most likely the one chosen due to the connections with the left side being evil, for example the Latin word sinister, meaning left. The sock would be filled with earth from the grave, taken to the boundary of the village, and thrown down into running water if possible. When waking, the vampire will be compelled to search for the missing item. The compulsion will be so strong that the creature will even enter the water to retrieve it, where it will drown, immersion being another method of destroying a vampire. 
Around the time that this podcast is first released, November the 1st, we find various places around the world where the return of the dead is marked out. This is not always, of course, purely vampire lore, but there is plenty of crossover. The peoples of the Abruzzi region of Italy, an agriculturally dependent area, drew on elements of both the ancient Roman Lemuria and Greek Anthesteria festivals of the dead. On November the 1st, they would place candles on the graves of their deceased family members, and also ensure that all of the windows and doors of their homes were well lit, to assist in the passage of the dead as they were able to return. The deceased would process from their graves on this date, with the good leading the way, followed by the evil. It was said that the performing of particular rituals would allow one to see these spirits, although it was very dangerous to do so. We may recognise many parallels here with similar customs throughout the world. This is the closest parallel we may find to vampire law in Italy, which, as a country, has no indigenous vampire species of its own. The more Christianised traditions around All Souls Day draw from these more ancient festivals also. At this time, November the 2nd, or the 3rd if the 2nd falls on a Sunday, we may see traditional soul cakes being eaten as a food offering to the returning dead. A little later in the month, on November the 30th, we find the Feast of St Andrew. This, along with St George's Feast Day and Easter, were considered to be the most feared times of the year in Romania. There was a belief here that vampires were particularly active in the run-up to the Feast of St Andrew, especially on St Andrew's Eve. Instead of lighting your windows and doors to welcome the dead, as with the earlier festivities just noted, here it was wise to rub garlic on them as a form of protection against vampire incursion. In some areas, it's also said that you may destroy a vampire by shooting. Of course, within the realms of fiction in both print and film, it is well known that a silver bullet should be used to destroy pretty much any supernatural creature, vampires, werewolves and their entourage but how much does this draw on the actual folklore record for its veracity? In alchemical terms, the element of silver is symbolic of the moon and of the goddess Diana, a figure often revered in some belief systems. Silver is considered to be effective against evil because of its bright, pure qualities, which are obviously at odds with the darker forces. For this reason, a silver crucifix would be considered even more powerful than a regular wooden one as a form of protection against vampires. As far as the actual process of shooting is concerned, it's not generally stated within folklore that a bullet used against vampires should be made of silver. This material, of course, would not have been available to most people living in rural communities. To slay a vampire, it was purely the case that shots should be fired into a grave or, in the case of the Nosferatu in Romania, directly into the heart. In some areas, the act of firing into the air was enough to dispel a vampire. Where we find one reference to silver in bullet form is in the Serbian region, where it was said that coins with crosses could be broken up and loaded into a shotgun to form a kind of anti-vampiric buckshot. This material would, of course, have the dual properties of protection from the silver and also from the cross. In the two episodes of this podcast, we've taken a good look at some aspects of vampire lore, but it feels as though our fangs have only scratched the surface of this topic. We've not considered the vampire in literature, or on film, sparkly or otherwise nor have we looked at examples of people who exhibited vampiric traits or considered themselves to be vampires, either as a modern pop cult or from the historical record, such as the serial killer Elizabeth Bathory. I'm sure that this is a topic to which we will return in the future. In the meantime, you hopefully have enough information to continue your own researches and stay safe. Thanks for listening. See you next time. This episode of the Folklore Podcast was written and presented by me, Mark Norman. Research assistance was provided by Tracy Norman. The Folklore Podcast is created and hosted by me, Mark Norman. Find out more about my writing and research at www.facebook.com slash 
Mark Norman Folklore. The Folklore Podcast Art Director is Melissa Martell. Find her work at www.mdmcreate.com. The Folklore Podcast will always be free to listen to, but it is an enormous amount of work to research, create, record and write two of these episodes every month. And so, we have created a simple way in which you can help to support the ongoing life of the Folklore Podcast. Please visit our website at www.thefolklorepodcast.com and click on support. There are various ways that you can help, and they don't all involve giving us money. Even just leaving a simple review on iTunes or other podcast apps helps to grow our audience. So please do visit and take a moment to help us to keep going. Thank you for listening. The Folklore Podcast theme music is written and performed by Gurdy Bird.